the most precise measurement ever taken on Earth was made by the two LIGO observatories when they detected gravitational wave 150914 in September 2015. What made it possible after decades of research and experimentation? One of the key upgrades in the new advanced LIGO technologies, which launched almost the same day as the historic discovery, was a far more complex array of innovations in the suspension of the mirrors inside the long vacuum tube arms. Innovations that kept the mirrors almost absolutely still, isolating them from all of the other vibrations in the environment, the noise, so they could detect the wiggle of a passing gravitational wave. A wiggle the size of one atom in the distance between the Earth and the Sun. We're here in the main hall of the LIGO Hanford Observatory. And the first stage of the suspension of LIGO, which decouples the, the mirrors inside the vacuum envelope from the ground, we don't want to sense ground motion, so we have to decouple it so they're isolated from ground motion. The very first stage of that is this HEPI system, the blue cross beams you see and the actuators. Each one of these four piers effectively holds up the 6,000 pound payload inside the vacuum envelope. And that system can move. If the ground moves one way, they move the chamber the opposite direction. And now, with, under our advanced LIGO system, we actually have all of these chambers linked so that if the ground is moving one direction, they'll move the chambers the opposite direction and keep everything still relatively. Our mirrors are sitting on the earth in one way or another and are shaken by seismic noise, whether it really comes from earthquakes and waves on ocean shores or from people walking by or trucks rumbling down the street or airplanes going overhead. And all, all of those things need to be filtered out. In advanced LIGO, we've used a much more sophisticated notion, which is having seismometers sitting on optical tables. If the seismometer feels it's starting to move, it generates an electrical signal, which then goes to a motor and holds the table still. So this, this object that we're looking at here is a seismometer. It's a device for measuring ground motion. It has itself inside of a mass, which is suspended, from a, some kind of pendulum and spring arrangement. So that if the ground moves, the mass sits still, it has inertia, and then we measure that distance between the outside shell and the inside. One of the fascinating things about LIGO to me is some of the simple physics that underlies it. So for example, our mirrors, they're pendulums, and they're pendulums so that if the ground moves, they stay still. Those mirrors are sitting on the earth, and the earth is very noisy, it jiggles everything. And you want to make sure that the thing that jiggles the, the mirrors is only the gravitational wave. So we use all sorts of tricks. And I'll show you one of the tricks. Here's one of the tricks. But what we do is we suspend the mirrors from a pendulum. Here is a sort of demonstration pendulum. And here's the mirror. And my hand will be the ground motion. And you notice if I move it very slowly or at low frequencies, the pendulum follows me. It follows the ground motion completely. Now let me wiggle it fast, and you'll notice the pendulum stands still while I'm wiggling. That's the basis of the idea. Now that's done with a tremendous elegance and, uh, you know, with cunning in this picture. This is what's actually in the apparatus, okay? And by the way, the principle I just showed you is very much like the principle in a car. It makes you comfortable in a Cadillac and sort of bumpy in a truck, you know? The way to think of it in real life is to take a yo-yo regular kid's yo-yo. You want to let it flow to the ground such that the plastic piece that you wind your string around is down and just hanging quiet. If you move your hand, the yo-yo doesn't move. And that's the advantage. In initial LIGO, our mirrors were suspended as a simple pendulum, which was basically with steel wire looped around the barrel of the mirror. That worked fine for the sensitivity level that we were trying to achieve, but we wanted to take a factor of 10 improvement in the sensitivity. And to do that, we had to move away from using a simple steel wire. We suspend our mirrors in advanced LIGO using fused silica fibers, a very pure form of glass. There's a little thread coming down here. 
Can you see that? Right, right on the tip of my hand. It's hard because it's glass and it's so tiny. It's a little bit less thick than a human hair. But these things have crazy tensile strength. So these are the suspensions of our LIGO mirrors. You wouldn't think you could take a 10 or 20 or 30 kilogram mirror and hang it on just a tiny, thin piece of glass. But glass is very strong in that direction. Don't touch it. If you touch it, it'll break right away. A few silica suspensions have been hanging in Geo 600 since around about 2001, with no breaks so far, which is very comforting. Norna Robertson, who's now in America, was part of the Glasgow group. And she was in charge of suspension technologies. And the Glasgow group discovered a way of hanging these things on glass fibers and bonding them in such a way that it all became one piece of glass. There wasn't a separate wire that would rub. It was all just like one piece of glass, mirror and the fibers. And she had a student, Sheila Rowan. The idea of glass and glass fibers goes back a long way. And in Glasgow, we were interested in exploring this idea um, with perhaps more standard fused silica. What could you do and how could that be scaled up? We in Glasgow worked hard on making the fibers, but to do that jointing step, we actually learned from colleagues at Stanford who'd been involved with the Gravity Probe B space experiment in which one of the challenges was to build an all-fused silica telescope for star tracking. They had actually developed a technique and patented a technique called silicate bonding, which is deceptively simple, but a powerful technique, it turned out, to be able to join hourglass fibres to the mirrors. Across LIGO, there's another story that you'll hear again and again about no one person um, working really in isolation, everybody works as a team. And so for the suspensions for advanced LIGO, that is an effort that actually took not just Glasgow but other groups in the UK working with colleagues in the US to come together and do that design. My research on that was concentrated on the kind of bottom end of the suspension, that final stage holding the fused silica mirror. But that itself has to hang from several stages of isolation because one stage isn't enough to isolate from all the noise to hold that mirror steady. So the advanced LIGO suspension is in fact a quadruple pendulum, so that's four stages um, to get the necessary isolation from seismic noise or seismic vibrations. When you have multiple pendulums, one suspension mounted onto the next one, we're really stopping all of the outside horizontal and vertical motions that come about due to movement of the earth. We're stopping all that from hitting our optic. And that's what we really need to keep that mirror very, very quiet, such that it can only move in the event of a gravitational wave. I had the advantage of being brought up by a mechanical engineer. My dad was someone that I loved very much and really admired. And he brought that, that, that engineering approach to life, for good or for bad, to everything that he did. And I knew that I wanted to be a mechanical engineer like my dad when I was very young. Now I also had the goal of having a Corvette by the time I graduated college. That was a help, so it seemed to really be an easy fit for me because I could see myself in what my dad was doing. I've been doing outreach for junior highs and high schools and college too a bit, but I think junior high is their key years for girls. I usually give a talk about um, how I got into engineering and why I got into engineering, and generally I do bring up my Corvette. <laughs> um, I bring up my pay as well. I make a good living, and that's important to a kid who's living, for example, in East LA. It's become quite important for me to try to work with 
especially younger girls in junior high and high school, and to say, this is what it looks like to be a mechanical engineer. This is what it looks like to work every day with your hands and with your brain. I think we really need to encourage young girls to make their future by their brain and not by their looks because that's the strongest thing you can bring to the table for your whole life.